question we've come across before. Which of the following does not cause ionization? Kind of thing. So pay, pay attention. So did ionization occur here? Do you see an electron leaving its shell? No. All you see is the incident x-ray photon and the scattered um, x-ray. So this is just scattered. And I wish, I need to fix, I need to fix this. This should really, I'm going to make this blue. So blue coming in, blue going out. So this is your classical or um, unmodified scatter. So here's an x-ray beam coming from the x-ray tube. It interacts with an atom of the body and it scatters. It does not lose any energy. It just scatters. Okay. It's called classical interactions. That's what I grew up with, or coherent coherent interaction. It's also my favorite is unmodified. Did anything um, change the x-ray photon other than the direction? Still the same frequency, wavelength, still the same energy. Okay, And so um, that's one thing that can happen. Uh, like I said, unmodified is a better term for it, I think. It's also called Raleigh and Thompson scattering or some other names for it. So again, I just um, have a um, summary. The angle of the incident photon, so the x-ray photon that um, is coming into the atom, it comes in at a 45 degree angle, it will scatter at a 45 degree angle. So usually the angle of the incident photon is equal to the scatter, angle of the scattered photon. As you, we said, no ionization occurs, and those are some other names for it. Okay. I think unmodified describes it best, but like I said, I um, was used to coherent. It's also called classical. So here's another interaction. So look at what happens. Here comes the incident x-ray photon from the x-ray tube. It hits a, an electron in the shell, knocks it out. So there it is. And then, um, then the x-ray beam gives up some of its energy to knocking out that electron and then it is scattered and you can clearly see it has less energy. So this is called um, the Compton or modified scatter. The, the x-ray photon, I like the name modified scatter, it does um, change in energy. So the, this is 100% energy coming in. If it took 40% of the energy to knock that out, how much energy is left here? 60. 60% as an example. So the energy of both of these will equal this energy. Okay, so that's the Compton effect. And then just a summary of that. Um, backscatter, let me just, <laughs> what can you be asked about backscatter? <laughs> a couple of things. Backscatter is radiation that has hit something and scattered back towards the source. Okay, so where are you when you take a portable x-ray? Six feet away. Six feet away, okay, <laughs> that's always good. Are you still in the room? Are you outside in the hall? Or are you still in the room? Okay, no matter, <laughs> no matter, no matter where you are, when you take that x-ray, you need to have sight of your patient. You need to always have sight of your patient when you're taking an x-ray. You should be looking through that window. If you go around the corner, make sure you peek back and as you take the x-ray, I don't know what to tell you, but you need to be looking at your patient. Um, so that being said, um, if you're standing behind an x-ray tube, you are not being protected for two reasons. Um, or if you're standing next to the x-ray tube, you know, we know x-rays come out the tube. They are not heat-seeking. X-rays don't come out and seek the heat of my body and turn around mid-air and come hit me, right? They're going to go in that direction until they hit the wall or the patient or whatever is in that direction. So the radiation that is scattered backwards towards the source can retain up to two-thirds its original energy. Radiation that is scattered and coming back to the, towards the source can retain up to two up to two thirds. So it can be pretty strong. So you don't. Which is the best place to stand in relationship 
to the patient at 90 degrees because from zero, zero to 90 degrees, the greater the angle, the weaker the scatter. But that doesn't necessarily apply to back scatter. Okay, so you don't want to <coughs> be standing there when the scatter is coming directly back towards the source, back scatter. The other thing is uh, standing by an x-ray tube is we all know they do what? They leak. leak. Okay, so they leak. So you don't want to be by the x-ray tube. So that's why the cord on your um, portable machine is stretches back as far as it goes. So stretch it back six feet. Do you wear your lead apron? No, sure. I know you don't. I know. Sure. I know you don't. Um, All the time. The best thing to do, the, the best habit to get into is step back six feet with your lead apron on. But you do what you want. Okay, you're old enough to know what's, what's best. So, um, so and, and like I said, that's, do any of your techs wear the lead apron? No. So Never we're totally anything. we're totally done with that. No. I wonder how that got started. <laughs> just took one bad apple, Miss. Uh, yeah, I it's guess so. On the portable, it's just yeah. <laughs> they will only have the need. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know what, everybody? No one knows quicker better than me. I don't dress the patient completely. I just get them on the table, put a sheet over them, push your pants down for this pelvic, you know. Pull your, your pants, pants up, down. get off the table, see ya, you know. <laughs> I've cut every corner there is to cut, I get that, you know. But then at what point do you stop doing that for safety issues? And it's not the patient safety I'm concerned about. They need the x-ray. Do you need those x-rays? At, at, um, at six feet, what is the amount of radiation that you're going to get? It, be, it is minimal. What's the specific number? If you're six feet away, you're going to get what? How much scatter radiation? A specific number. What is six squared in inverse? One thirty-six. One thirty-six. If you're six feet away, you're going to get one thirty-six of whatever the patient got. Well, or of scatter, less than what the patient got. But that's one thirty-six. That's not everybody. That's not zero. Just so you know. Just, you do what you want. You're getting a every Heck, I've stood behind the tube for a long time, so, uh, you know, I'm still going. We'll, we'll find out. I'll let you know how long I live. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, uh, we're off that. Let's go to this one. Here comes the x-ray photon interacts with the atom and knocks the electron out of its shell, completely knocks it out. What's missing on this picture? The one. Do you see any scattered x-ray photon? We see the x-ray photon and it knocks it out and then where's the scatter, right? One, two. So we're missing the scatter. So what happened in this interaction? The x-ray, it took all of its energy to knock this electron out and that's called photoelectric effect. Oh wait, there it is photoelectric effect or photoelectric interaction. So the x-ray photon is absorbed. So again, um, now everybody looking at that picture, it was an inner, inner um, electron that was ejected. So what happens then when you have an inner shell vacancy of an atom, what happens? An outer shell fills it. An outer, outer shell, shell drops shell. into an inner shell vacancy. And then what happens? An x-ray photon is produced. Where are we? In the body. We're talking about x-rays in the body. So when you have an outer shell electron into an inner shell vacancy, you have a brand new x-ray photon. Well, how, what is the strength of that x-ray photon? The difference in binding energy. What would you think about the binding energies of a carbon atom? Uh, atomic number of six. Would the binding energies of the atom be great or large or high or low? Low. 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 Very, very low. So those x-ray photons are very low energy. Very low. So, so the where do it. they go? Do they come out of the patient no. into the air? No, they're so low, they're going to be absorbed in the patient. So that's why the photoelectric, for two reasons, the initial x-ray photon is absorbed, and then the secondary new x-ray photon is absorbed. 
So maybe you might think about those letters. Just a thought. Just a thought. Okay, so, so that is why x-rays, you know, that's why we have regulations on them. That's why, um, you know, you don't take an x-ray without a doctor's order. The benefit has to outweigh the risk. You are causing more, you know, internal, you know, mm, damage. So be careful with that. So characteristic radiation, again, is dependent on the atomic number, right? Only one thing will determine characteristic radiation, and that's the atomic number. So and here's a, like, here are some of the binding energies, and, and you certainly don't have to memorize these, but just to give you an idea, like the calcium, um, which is, you know, a higher atomic number. So the x-ray photon produced by the, you know, the inside the K-shell electron being injected in the outer shell dropping into that, that's about the most you're going to have energy-wise. So that's 4K KB or 4 KEB. So it's going to be reabsorbed into the body. So um, increase the atomic number. What happens to the binding energy? Of, the, of that atom. If you increase the atomic number of an atom, what happens to the binding energy? It increases. Yeah, of course it increases. That increases. So what happens to the chance of photoelectric occurrence interact, uh, occurring? Let me ask you this. You know this. The higher the atomic number, what's going to happen to the x-ray beam? What do you take an x-ray of that, absorb, that absorbs all the x-rays? Think of an, an x-ray you took today. Did, was there any metal in your x-ray? Was there a prosthetic device? Was there a pacemaker? Did someone leave their metal necklace on? Right? And, and what did that look like on the x-ray? White. White. Because? The x-rays were absorbed in that metal. It's a high atomic number. What's the atomic number of air? I don't know either. Low. <laughs> it's low. So x-rays go right through that. What does that look like on an image? Black. Black. So the higher the atomic number, the more ch bone, calcium. You know, higher atomic number has the ability to absorb those x-rays. So the higher the atomic number, greater the chance of a photoelectric occurrence happening. So those are interactions. The other two, photo disintegration um, and pair production are in radiation therapy, so I'm, I'm not going to cover those. Okay, so we know what attenuation is. What is the definition of attenuation? Now, I teach my beginners this, and, and it probably sticks, and some of you were in my prerequisite class. Um, I always tell them to think of attenuation as absorption, but that is that is not totally correct. Okay, there's other things. So attenuation is a reduction in the number of X-ray photons hitting the image receptor. So it's just a reduction in number. Because are all the X-rays absorbed? No, <laughs> they better not be, or you won't get an image. So you want some of them to go on through. Now, so what, what affects attenuation, the reduction in the number? So some of the x-rays are absorbed in the body, and then some of them are scattered off the image receptor. Sometimes they're scattered laterally to where they don't, you know, the um, scattered photon doesn't even hit the image <coughs> receptor. So scatter would contribute to attenuation also. Okay, so, um, so what... What, uh, what, bless you, what affects attenuation? What are some things that affect attenuation? Tissue thickness, how thick the material is, what is the, what is the material? One inch of bone or one inch of lung? You know, that would make a difference. And the density of, the, of whatever it is that we're um, imaging. So all of these, and that's pretty basic. Yes, distance affects intensity. It's not an attenuation. Air does not attenuate the X-ray beam, but that distance affects the intensity of the beam because it's like a light. 
Uh, okay, so this is a, a little bit different topic, but it's a good question. The question was, what about distance? And so, um, so I have an answer to that. Oh, here it is. No, 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 it's, it's a good question. That's why I want to explain it. Okay, so um, you have the flashlight, and it has um, so much <laughs> so much light coming out. That tube is dead. Yeah. Okay, I'll show you after break. Okay, but think of the light. Think of the light out of the light of the flashlight. Here comes the light. And um, how do I make the light stronger? I bring it up closer to the wall, right? And then the light becomes very intense. I bring it a farther away, and then the light spreads it out. It becomes less intense. It's only by the spreading of the light that affects the intensity, because that, is the light different? No, I still have the same amount of batteries in here. I didn't add more batteries or stronger batteries or weaker batteries. It's still the same amount. It's just the distance is affecting. And how does the distance affect the intensity? The intensity has not changed. I'm just spreading out the intensity over a bigger area, less bright, or putting the intensity in a greater in a smaller area and making it greater. So that's the only thing that affects that. So good question though. Okay, properties of x-rays. Um, when Wilhelm Conrad uh, Remkin discovered x-rays, he did all sorts of experiments and was looking at, um, he came up with most, most of these um, and uh, they haven't changed um, much over time. And then some have been added, but they're pretty much, um, standardized now. They travel in straight lines, they're invisible, they're highly penetrating, uh, dark and photographic film. So you've, you've had these. There we are, the polyenergetic, now you know the Brin's radiation. Um, the x-ray beam coming out has many different energies. Um, I don't know, I always, right or wrong, I always um, explain um, the x-ray photons coming out of the tube as just one burst of an occurrence happening and you have these little raindrops and some are bigger, some are smaller, some kind of group together, some are spread apart from each other. So it's just one down four and we're done. And so um, so we get that, that's a polyenergetic beam or a heterogeneous beam. Okay, homogeneous means the same, heterogeneous means different. <coughs> so um, ionizes electrically neutral, it causes, um, as we know, chemical and biological changes. Sc scatter occurs and secondary radiation, two different things. Scatter is a primary beam, scattering, and secondary is when you have the primary beam producing a new and second X-ray photon. Okay, so secondary and scatter are not the same thing. And then you have to focus by a lens like a light, like a camera has a lens and you <laughs> adjust it to focus the image. You can't do that with X-rays. I, I think they could drop that one, but anyway. Um, when we describe x-rays, am I going too fast or are you okay? Mm -hmm. Not okay. fast enough? Um, when you're looking at um, an x-ray um, sine wave, this represents an x-ray photon. You can describe the x-ray photon in terms of uh, frequency, wavelength, and energy. So which one, the top one or the bottom one, has a higher frequency? Bottom one. Okay, this one has a higher frequency. The number of cycles per second is frequency. Which one has a longer wavelength? Top, top one. one. The top one. Which one has a higher energy? Bottom one. Bottom one. Bottom one. So what is the relationship between frequency and energy? As one goes up, so does the other. Yeah, they're direct relationship. Increase the frequency, um, increase the energy. What What about wavelength? As the energy of the um, as the frequency increases, what happened to the wavelength? Decreases. It decreased. So tell me about wavelength and energy. They're inversely proportional. So they're inversely proportional. So um, which this has a greater wavelength, a longer mm, longer wavelength, lower energy. Um, so, what's the energy of this one? Low. Low. Low energy, high energy. Which one goes faster? The bottom one. They're all the same. Oh, yeah. They're the same. That's a trick. question. That's right. Question. They all travel at the speed of light now. And it's okay. That's what happens to us. I'm, you miss it now so you don't miss it later. 
they travel at the speed of light. They travel at the same speed. The only thing that's going to change is the frequency and wavelength. Okay? But it doesn't matter about the energy. They both travel. The velocity is the same. Okay, here's your inverse square law. Do you remember this? The x-ray beam is 30 mR at 2 meters. What is the intensity at 1 meter? Do you need, do you need a calculator for this? No. It's like if you're at 2 meters and you get closer, what do you think is going to happen? 7.5? What do you think? What's gonna, is it going to be greater or lesser than 30? You're at 2 meters away oh, yeah. from the source. And now you move closer. Oh no, it's going to be. Is your exposure going to be more or less? More. More. It's going to be so you're going to be greater than 30. <laughs> By how much more? So it, uh, inverse square law is inversely, propor inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So what happened to the distance? You you got, got halved the, it. it. You went from two meters to one meters. You halved it. So square that. Inversely proportional to the square of the distance, so one fourth. Now invert it, inverse and square. So it's four times oh, as much. Right. So it's one twenty. It's not like forty. I should have made you guess. Oh, what do you think it'd be? You know, it's higher than thirty by how much? By a factor of four. So inverse square law is good for you to know for radiation protection purposes. Okay. So, so distance, if you, what are the three cardinal rules of radiation protection? Time, distance, Time, and shielding. Time, distance, and shielding. Which one's best if you could only pick one? Distance. 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 So your six feet without the lead apron is better than being closer with the lead apron. But what's best? Okay, you know, do you know the answer? Okay. So, okay, here, um, now, the direct square law. This is for your, your tech, uh, for your imaging purposes. So when you, I mean, how many times have you, and I hate to even ask this, how many times have you had to adjust your mass? How many times, when do you change your distance from 40 inch SIB? When, uh, portables. Okay, hey, portables, do you, do you, yeah. <laughs> well, let me, let me ask you, do you, um, do you try to get your 72 inches when you do portables or? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, and are you pretty successful at that? Yeah, foot, foot of the bed. Do you adjust your um, technical factors if you can't get your 72 inches? You should. <laughs> you should. Don't lie. <laughs> you need to think. What is, yeah. what is, your, what is your purpose in life? What is your purpose, <laughs> what is your purpose in your profession? Alara. Alara. So you're not... If you're in near, 136 of a higher technique is more than 136 of a lower technique. Mm -hmm. So are you in the room when you're making that exposure and you're not adjusting for that change in distance? It's just something to think about. Um, there are times when you won't get the same distance. You don't have to get a calculator out and do an inverse or a direct square law thing. Just get close. Mm -hmm. If you know you can't get your 72 inches and you can only get, I don't know what, give me a number. 68. Okay, that's close enough. I wouldn't change it for that. Okay, 50. That's, that's okay, let's not work with 72. Let's work with 80. Yeah, so 40. Instead of, and so, and don't mm -hmm. use, what is 50 compared to 80? I don't know, but I know 40 is half. Mm -hmm. So direct square law, reduce your technical factors by four. Uh, by a fourth. Go to a fourth. Mm -hmm. You'll be close enough. It is digital. Mm -hmm. You'll be close enough. Okay, don't do a fourth. Do a third. Or an eighth. Or just half it. Do something. Don't use the same <laughs> thing. That's a, that's a significant amount. 68 to 72, I, I wouldn't do too much. But any, you know, any... Is, uh, is square of the distance. So your one, one inch squared is one. Two inches, four. Four inches, 16. You see what I'm talking about? So it, it makes a difference. Your distance can make a difference. So 
for your technical factors, you do the direct square law. We're talking about mass. So if you're getting closer to the patient and, and you're using your 72 inch distance, your technique for that, and you're closer to the patient, you need to back off your what? What are you going to back off? Mass. The mass is the easiest thing to do. At least half it. Do something. Just please, anything, you know. Um, so the direct square law is for imaging purposes. Inverse square law is, is uh, applicable for our radiation protection purposes. Okay. Um, okay, what controls the number of electrons produced at the cathode? MA. MA, MA pr uh, controls quantity. What drives the electrons across? KV. KV. Uh, what does the time control? Amount. The length of the time. The length of time that this is happening. That's your exposure time. Uh, what is the charge of the focusing cup, as you can see right here? Keeps Anything them, on this side is negative. Keeps so them the condensed, right? The focusing cup is negative. What's this made of? What metal? Anybody remember? Hmm. Nickel. Nickel. Usually nickel. What's the filament typically? Or tungsten. Mostly made of. Tungsten. Target. Tungsten. Tungsten. What is the purpose of the focusing cup? And that is to keep those electrons close together. What do two negative electrons like to do? That's right. And so if they're spreading out here, if you didn't have the focusing cup, then they're going to be spreading out and hitting a larger target. And therefore, the details will be affected. So we're trying to keep them as close together as possible. That's why the anode and the cathode are so close together. The further apart they would be, the more chance of the electrons um, repelling each other. Beam quality is um, controlled by KB. So not my favorite word, quality, but the quality of the beam refers to the strength or the penetrating power of the beam. So how do you make a beam stronger? Uh, how do you make it more penetrating? And that's to increase the KB. So what, in, okay, so we'll leave it at that. Uh, the 15% rule is only applicable to KV. It's only, uh, I'm not, I, I don't change my KVs much. Um, I'm a fixed KV kind of gal and then I just change the mass. It's easier. Um, sometimes I change a little bit of both. As you well know, everyone has their own techniques, but the 15% rule is the only thing that is used for KV. Okay, and so basically, if you are trying to manipulate your exposure to an image using KV, you, if you want to half or um, increase double or half the um, exposure to um, an image, then you can use KV and use the 15% rule. Okay, so if I increase the KV by 15%, that doubles the density on a radiograph or exposure. If I go down 15% in the KV, then that's going to give me half the exposure um, on the image receptor, okay? When do you want to do that? What, what does, if you're off 15%, let's just, I don't know, um, let's just say you're doing a hand. What's 15% of 50? About 10 KV? You're going to pull it maybe 7 kV. You're, you're pulling your kV range out of maybe what you want to use for a hand. 15% of a higher number is more. <laughs> so now you're getting, at some times, you can get out of your kV range. What is a hand? 50, give or take 5 kV? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's okay, but now at, at 57, you're out of that 5 kV range. And as you get up to 60, it's, it changes your penetrating power of the kV range. So I just pick the KV that's necessary to penetrate that body part and then change the mass accordingly, or the MA or the time. If I need more exposure than I go up, how much do you go up in your MA or your time? Do you ever do that? Have you ever had to adjust your technical factors? Mm -hmm. When? Tell me one time. Ribs. ribs. Okay, how come you had to change it for ribs? The exposure time. Okay, the exposure, and you wanted um, um, breathing technique? Okay, so you had to change your technical factors, good. I think that's good. Have you ever, have you ever taken an x-ray and you're not within your exposure range and then the, didn't repeat it, but the next time you did it, did you adjust your technical factors? 
I, I hope you're paying attention to those sort of things. We have certainly preached that before in here, paying attention to your exposure index values and adjusting that accordingly. So 15% rule is affecting 